it's great to be part of a celebration for Athena Marku. I uh, really liked Athena and um, was always incredibly impressed with her work and her scholarship. And uh, today's session have just uh, educated me more on, on how striking her contributions are. I've always felt like intracranial self-stimulation was one of the best quantitative ways from a pharmacological viewpoint to, to look at independent of sort of food or, or drug or other confounders uh, with self-administration. And I admired Athena's work on that. Not only did she do reward, she did the anhedonia. And, it, and uh, um, it always uh, struck me as some of the best uh, science. Um, and she worked a lot on dependence uh, therapies as well. And I think her work continues to form a foundation for uh, other studies. I, I won't talk uh, much about these. I'm going to talk about adolescence because that's uh, what I really worked with her on and, and tried to move her to adolescence, thinking uh, most of addiction starts in adolescence. Uh, but I can tell you we've uh, recently found in a uh, ethanol self-administration uh, model that neuroimmune activation increases mglur 2 receptor expression in the nucleus accumbens and very much increases the sensitivity to mglur 2 uh, drugs uh, in uh, self-administering alcohol rats. And so we continue to build on, on discoveries that uh, she led us to. And if I press a button. Which button? This button. Ah, <coughs> but um, I was asked to put together pictures, and, and oh, in almost all my pictures, Athena's in a ski outfit. And you can pick her out by being, uh, by being an orange. Uh, but we enjoyed a lot of time together on the ski slopes. And uh, really, when I got to know Mark and Athena, it was in the, the early 2000s when there were two uh, conferences that Dora Duca and I uh, put together in Morzine, France, uh, one on uh, adolescence, and again, the, the theme that really addiction starts in adolescence, and the other was on impulsivity, uh, which is an adolescent characteristic. And uh, here we are on the, the slopes. Um, together. And uh, this is Morzine, uh, looking to the, roo the, the rooftops up to a, a town called Avoriaz. These are buildings here. And we would spend the day uh, up here uh, skiing after the morning sessions, of course. Um, and uh, really enjoyed that. Um, this is one uh, slope, but uh, here we are on the ski lift together. And, and uh, some of these places I may have wrong because the background looks pretty similar at most mountains uh, covered with snow. Um, but this is from uh, Avoriaz itself, uh, looking down to Morzine here. And I recall we really would enjoy a day, and then we'd have to ski uh, back behind this building and down along the top of these slopes to uh, a place that would take us back down uh, to um, Morzine. And um, I think this might be the time we skied in three countries in one day uh, in Morzine together, going around. And, and there's uh, Bert, Bert Weiss, many of you know. And this is uh, Derek from uh, Canada. And uh, Bert and I were debating where this was. And, I think it's Morzine. I think that's Athena going down the slopes. Um, some more uh, pictures and then sort of some sunset views. I think actually that might be Athena right there. Uh, and uh, it, it was quite beautiful. And, and uh, we really got to know each other. And I kept trying to talk her into working on adolescence. She really didn't. George had a student, I think, Laura O'Dell, and they did some work 
that Athena was involved with uh, in nicotine in adolescence. But it took, it took a couple of years. Uh, but we were lucky enough that the Institute recognized adolescence as being important, and I was, was able to convince Athena to join me in a consortium uh, we called the NADIA, Neurobiology of Adolescent <laughs> Drinking in Adulthood. And um, I want to show that uh, work today, uh, particularly uh, Svetlana, I know is, whoops, Svetlana I know is here. Uh, I don't know if Natalie's here, but they were the two uh, primary scientists working with Athena on this. And, and uh, what she found, uh, it, using a, a number of different uh, alcohol treatments, but in this sort of mild or cohort one uh, treatment, which is similar to the model uh, most of us are using, uh, sort of an intermittent administration, because adolescents don't drink or take drugs every day. They tend to be weekend abusers, and then they go to school during the week. Um, and uh, she showed, in fact, that there were really significant, long-lasting changes in uh, ICSS after fairly moderate alcohol treatment in adolescence. And I think most of us who are working on the adolescents find these long-lasting, persistent changes that we think really are, are consistent with the brain being more sensitive to uh, becoming addicted to a substance when it's uh, when it's maturing. Um, and she also showed some of these animals actually had what's called a lowering of seizure threshold, which would be then enhanced reward. And I can say we have now seven labs have all seen adults after adolescent exposure drinking much more alcohol, having higher preferences, and uh, uh, as if there's lasting persistent effect and, and following up on, on Athena's work on that. She also showed this lasting uh, anxiety-like uh, behavior uh, using, the, this is the uh, radial arm maze, um, and showed that equivalent treatments of adults uh, didn't show anxiety-like behavior like uh, an adolescent did. And this is, this is uh, 25 days after the last exposure to alcohol. So these seem to be persistent <laughs> Uh, lasting effects, and um, this experiment, which which I did uh, participate in, uh, some of the immunohistochemical part uh, was quite, um, I thought, exciting, uh, but also an example of uh, Athena's scholarship. Um, she showed that in this sort of probability task. Uh, as Dr. Pizzagalli said, in humans it's the same. Uh, humans and rats learn that the, if they, they'll go for the biggest reward and they learn that's the one to press. Uh, but as she decreased the probability of reward, uh, animals that are normal begin to realize that they work less and get more rewards if they just go to the one pellet, one press paradigm. Whereas in this case, they have to press 12 times to get four pellets. And the alcohol, uh, and this is again long after the alcohol treatment, uh, you see that they uh, continue to make the risky choices. Now, we had been studying frontal cortex and orbital frontal cortex, and, and I said, I think this might be perseveration because they're perseverating on the, the large choice. And that, that could explain this. And Athena corrected me in her charming way, told me, no, I'm wrong. I have to look at the complete data set. And she had done the experiment in the reverse way. And so here, when the first uh, chance is to press, still you see in the uh, adolescent treated uh, alcohol, these are adults after adolescent treatment, that they're making the risky choice to a much greater extent than the controls. And of course, again, at the end, when it, when it goes away. Now, we had measured a bunch of neurotransmitters uh, and actually had hypothesized that this was a dopaminergic change. And so we had measured tyrosine hydroxylase changes in the frontal cortex. 
But um, we'd also measured uh, cholinergic uh, septal neurons, and uh, we were quite, uh, I was a bit surprised when Athena called me up and said, it correlates with the cholinergic neurons, not, not the tyrosine hydroxylase. We were actually quite uh, surprised. It's not the greatest correlation, but we've seen in, in uh, multiple labs uh, across the Nadia this cholinergic, modest cholinergic deficit. And we think it might be uh, important for uh, brain regional circuitry. Acetylcholine uh, certainly is, is known uh, to do that. And uh, um, she's continued uh, to do some studies, but to go back to skiing, I, I actually saw her this January and felt she was healthy and had gotten through it and, and felt really good. Uh, this is two years ago. Um, we were in Big Sky. Uh, it was cold. You can tell by Mark's mustache there. Um, but we were skiing and, and enjoying it uh, and had dinner. Uh, some of you may know Leslie Morrow, my, my colleague. And we had a nice uh, dinner that, that day. And um, we all went to Yellowstone Park uh, for a day uh, to see it in the winter. And uh, we were in this um, van with had a caterpillar on the back and these skis on the front, and they'd stop uh, periodically. This is uh, Athena and Mark back there. This is uh, Greta, my significant other that many of you know. Um, and so we spent the day uh, traveling around uh, in this van in Yellowstone, and there were bison blocking the roads at times, but it was quite quite fun and, and adventurous. Um, they have hot springs there um, that were beautiful. Uh, the water flowing and steaming with the snow and, and various uh, aspects. And we, we did some hiking. Really was an enjoyable day. Um, and she still is keep publishing. Um, and so these are, are more recent uh, papers that, that kind of have come out. Um, CRF in the amygdala has been proposed to be really important uh, by, by several in the audience, and, and she found that the adolescent treatment it did increase uh, CRF in the amygdala, and we're following up on that. That's, this is independent of stress. And um, in addition, she's shown that this Adolescent alcohol um, treatment impacts uh, nicotine uh, discrimination, but it, it's made me wonder if, if the work that Paul Kenny talked about and uh, how you get a satiation from his habenula uh, track with nicotine uh, might, in fact, be impacted, and that that might be some of what um, these findings are related to. But this is now alcohol exposure, maturation to adulthood, changing the adult uh, response to nicotine. And so um, I miss Athena. Uh, she was a friend, a scholar, and a scientist. Thank you.